Hi, everyone. In this video, I want to discuss um, a chapter from The Thrill of the Chase, and also it was an online article that Boris Wren had written called My War for Me. And I want to discuss how that relates to a solution and how and where he discovered his special place in Vietnam and how that might relate to a solve. I discussed this in the past, but I kind of wanted to condense it into the smaller video for you guys that might be interested in this stuff. Now, although in my war for me, Forrest Fenn discusses the Korean War, that went on from 1950 to 1953, and that was one of the reasons why he had signed up into the military, as he describes. But the rest of that chapter really doesn't discuss anything beyond what I have on this page here. And of course, he first mentions the uh, first Indochina War. That went on from 1946 to 1954. And that war had many battles, but two of them that I want to focus on in particular is the Battle at An Ki and also the Battle of Mang Yang Pass. The reason why I need to discuss that is because that's where these graves that he tripped over come into play. Boris Fenn didn't get involved in uh, the Vietnam War until the Tet Offensive in 1968. The USA's involvement in the Vietnam War was from approximately 1964 to 1975. But again, Boris Fenn did not come in until the Tet Offensive, which went from January 1968 to September of 1968. And one of these things that all of this has in common is a road called QL-19, and it's one of the most deadly roads that was in both of these wars. And I'm going to describe that now. Okay, first I want to describe what's known as Mang Yang Pass. Mang Yang Pass is located right here. Okay, and Mang Yang Pass provided a beautiful view of what's known as the Central Highlands in Vietnam, which is this area up here, okay? And people that would, would travel through Mang Yang Pass would go along this road called UL-19, right? Now, if you translate Mang Yang Pass in the local language, which is called Jirai, Mang Yang Pass means the heaven's gate. The word Yang itself means a spirit a deity or a god. QL-19, this road, which is in black here, basically goes from a province called Qinan, which is over here. It comes up here. It cuts through a place called Anki, and then it goes through Mangyang Pass, and then it comes up to a place known as Paliku, which is over here. And then, of course, west of here, you have the border with Cambodia. Now, during the uh, Indochina War, QL-19, again, this black road, was a very dangerous stretch of road. The French were had a base over here in Paliku, and they would often travel that road to fight battles along this road. Okay? The men in a group called French Mobile Group 100 were on a fence at a place called Anki Pass, which is over here. They were fighting over there. And on uh, June 24th in 1954, they were ordered by the superiors to retreat back to Paliku. And they went back along QL-19, and the enemy had come in ahead of them. And basically, they were ambushed all up around here. They lost 1,600 men that day, and they surrendered, ending the Indochina War later that same week. The South Vietnamese buried the dead up on the crest of Mang Yang, up in this area. They were buried in deep graves in a standing position facing west towards France. And the graves were filled in with lime to help decompose her, and it quickly became overgrown with grass. This area was known as the graveyard in the clouds locally. Again, the Vietnamese are very, very spiritual people. These graves that were up here remained uh, for many years until they were returned to their families in France between 1986 and 1987. Okay, Many of those graves were marked with stone obelisks and in some cases just small aluminum markers. 
the markers were in Vietnamese, and the obelisks were in Vietnamese and French, but some of the small markers and the, the obelisks had epitaphs that were sometimes in English. Uh, hence the example that Forrest gave you, what he discovered when he was in this area. During the, the um, Vietnam War, these graves, of course, still existed up here. And the same road here, we used as a major supply route. We would have the Navy come in here with supplies, and they would truck the supplies up across this road. And from 1965 to 1971, there was a military base over here, an Army base, and it was called Camp Radcliffe. It was established because of all the trouble that they had along this road, of course, as they were bringing in supplies. So in 1965, they created that. And the soldiers locally referred to it as a golf course because they had a lot of uh, officers that would stay there. And they actually did have a couple of holes, I think, where you could, you know, makeshift holes where you could play uh, golf. Now, the convoys that were headed westbound on this road were known as the Friscos. And the eastbound convoys that were coming out of this town were known as the New Yorkers. So the New Yorkers were heading back east, and the Friscos were heading back west. All right. So over the years, we kind of became complacent because we had the base here, and the number of attacks along the road were not as heavy as they normally were until 1967. In 1967, we were ambushed along this same road, and we had suffered casualties, not as much as the French did in one day, um, and, but we, we suffered casualties there. And as a result of that, we also set up radio communi communication towers up here. So there was a lot of folks during the early part of uh, Vietnam in the you know, later 60s that, that spent time up here. And if you look online, you can actually find stories about soldiers that spent time up there in the grave at night and how spooky it was and stuff like that. So basically, we tightened up defense along this road. A friend of mine, I'm just going to call him John. He was born in 1947, and he passed away in 2013. He was in the Vietnam War. He entered the war when he was only 19 years old in 1966. And he stayed there until he was 20 in 1967. He was in the Navy, and he worked as what's called a door gunner. They were the crewmen tasked with firing and maintaining weapons aboard military helicopters. So he's, when I talked to him about this road, he told me, you know, many stories about battles that they had because he was kind of up close. You know, like I said, he would hang out of the helicopter as they were close to the ground because they would fly in to bring troops in and out, move them around and bring in supplies and kind of go ahead of the convoys. So he spent a lot of time from 66 to 67 along this road. So I, I knew the story. As soon as I read my war for me, I knew what Forrest was talking about because I had discussed this all in the past with my, my friend, right? And um, Forrest's friend, of course, didn't enter into the Vietnam War until what was known as the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive went on from January 1968 to September 1968. And basically, it was a coordinated series of attacks by the North Vietnamese on over 100 cities and outposts in South Vietnam. They worked along with what, what was called the Viet Cong, which is a rebel group of South Vietnamese people. So basically, the entire time that Forrest was in the Vietnam War, we were being attacked in South Vietnam, even though we were fighting the North Vietnamese. In fact, his base down here was one of the places that got attacked, all right? So this area, again, became a hotbed of attacks. And that was one of the reasons why, when I discussed with Forrest Fenn, I didn't believe that he flew into this place. Because I can't imagine him being in the Air Force and talking to his Army buddy who was probably stationed up here because this was an army base, an army helicopter base, 
And he flew down here, picked up Forrest, and then flew Forrest up here. And Forrest, when I made that video in 2018, he actually congratulated me on all the research that I did because I found the location where he tripped over the grave. And I'm going to show you some close-ups and stuff of that shortly. But I found that location, and the only thing Forrest Fenn corrected me on were two points. One point is he said that I was pronouncing Tuiwa wrong. I was pronouncing it Toihoa, and it's actually Tuiwa. And the second thing he corrected me on, of course, I already knew this, is that he had security briefings. So he would know where, where it was currently hot along this road. So he would pick a safe time. Had he got, now, I still don't believe he went up there, and I told him that. And again, and then I, I, I actually discussed over time, um, not the solution, but a lot. I showed him pictures of my friend and pictures that my friend had from the war. And I kind of discussed all the stuff that was happening in this area. And again, I'm sure that uh, Forrest Fenn was well aware of all of that because he would, he would, he, this is some of the areas that he would bomb. He says he bombed the Hoochimon Trail. The Hoochimon Trail is a big swath that basically cuts up from Saigon all the way up north, up toward North Vietnam. And it was basically a supply route for them. And of course, they would hide up in the peaks of all of these mountains. And that's where how Forrest got shot down. Well, incidentally, my friend John, who passed away in 2013, he was shot twice. The first time when he was shot down, well, he wasn't necessarily shot down. He was shot in the leg while he was hanging out of the helicopter. So they had to bring him back and they had to bring him to the hospital. He received a purple heart, had some surgery on his leg. But instead of going home, he actually went back to the war again to fight again. And again, almost all his battles were along this road, even though he was in the Navy. As I said, the Navy worked with the Army, and they would basically come up from here. And again, this is just north of where Forrest was based. Forrest wasn't there yet because this was 1966 and 67. But basically, he would fight along this road. So again, in 1967, my friend John was shot. This time, he got shot in the head, and it blew a piece of his skull off. Fortunately, he lived. They ended up having to put a plate in his head. But that man, at that time, he did go home. He got his second Purple Heart, and they wouldn't let him go back. So he went home. And I, and I got to say, you know, John was a hell of a man. <laughs> When he went home, he lived about, about four houses down from me, and he was part of the fire department, volunteer fire department that we were in. He was always helping out the town. He was always helping people. He was a really great guy. Um, and when I read my war for me, and Forrest talks about leave the soldier along, loan what he's in thought, I know exactly what Forrest is talking about. I never been here, but I experienced it with John. We would sometimes be out at, uh, you know, drinking a few beers or out hanging out at a barbecue on my street or at the fire department. And he would just all of a sudden, like, break into this really strange mood and he would start, like, bawling his eyes out. And he would tell me stories of, you know, Troy, you know, I killed women and children. You know, I mean, <clears throat> he could see, you know, Forrest was up a thousand feet or a few thousand feet. He talks about being able to see the face of a, a priest at a funeral. I don't know, but I can tell you that my buddy John did. And when I say women and children, yeah, when they would land along this road to retrieve troops, you had to be very careful because, again, the Viet Cong would actually use kids and women and they would be have hand grenades and stuff loaded on them and they would pull the pin and run up to a soldier and try to blow them up. So it was very, very nasty. I can't imagine being 18 or 19 years old and being up front face to face. I mean, it's even worse for guys that were in the Army and the Marines. At least my buddy was, for the most part, up in a helicopter. But I can't imagine it. But I, but I know exactly what Forrest Farm was talking about. And I could definitely see why he would have ties to this area. Like I said, it was, this is a very spiritual place. And the Vietnamese are very spiritual people. 
and this was known as the Heaven Ga- Heaven's Gate. So the Vietnamese people buried the 1,600 Frenchmen all up here. And it wasn't until 1960, 1986 and 87 when the Vietnamese uh, exhumed the graves and sent the remains back to the families in France. Anyway, very, very interesting stuff and very sad, to be honest with you. So let me show you a couple of pictures. Okay, here's one picture of a topographical map, uh, and you can kind of see what Mangyang Pass looks like. The road is, you know, QL19 is coming up through there. This is the only waterway that's on the south side, and it actually goes way up here, all right? And down here, like I said, the pass is roughly from here to here, all right? And the, the ambush to the French happened down here. But all along this road, there was blowing out tanks and all kinds of damage from the war. And some of that stuff still existed during the Vietnam War from the Indochina War. The grave site was right up here in this area. Okay. And then our radar tower I was talking about was right up in this area. Here's another view of that map. Here's Mang Yang Pass again. This is actually from Google Earth. And I took it upon myself in red to go and try to recreate these uh, roads and switchbacks that went up into the mountains. And the cemetery, like I said, was located here. The radio relay station was located here. And it's very interesting when you look at this and then think about um, the medicine wheel, because the medicine wheel also has a military radio station right next to where the wheel is on another peak across from it, right? And I know Forrest Trump was aware of the one in, in um, there because it was used by the uh, Air Force for bombing run practice runs in the Bighorn Basin during the 60s. In fact, there used to be a secret Air Force base over by Ralston. And I asked Forrest friend if he was ever at that base and he didn't didn't answer or wouldn't answer the question. He didn't, he didn't reply. So basically here's that town again. There's a river that goes up here and it goes up, you know, and I don't know how far up it goes, but that's the only one north of this. There's other rivers going in the other direction, but you got to remember that this is kind of like a, um, you know, these are jungles. This is like swamp. So, there's water all over the place in tiny waterfalls and streams, brooks, stuff like that. Here's another shot from Google Earth, and this is a perspective shot so that you can see that the cemetery was up on a peak, and then the relay tower was over here. Here's Mangyang Pass again, and then that river, of course, goes right up here. And again, when I look at this, this reminds me of Five Springs. Five Springs, the camp would be over here. Of course, everything's swapped or mirrored. This is where the... Uh, you know, the, the home of Brown and the wheel would be, and then the radio towers over there. Interesting stuff. But this is a perspective I just want to show you. This isn't the highest peak, but this is the highest peak that you can overlook and see down here. You know, if you overlook the edge of the car, that's over here. On this side, there are some waterfalls, and I think I got a picture of one here. Now, this is in Google Earth. This is uh, a recent picture. The image date is 2-13-2021. This is that same cemetery. As you can see, the roads are all overgrown. All of the graves, like I said, most of them are exhumed and the remains were sent back, but it's all overgrown now with trees and, shr and shrubbery. You, you can't see the white dots any longer unless you go back. Here's one from 2004. That's the earliest one that actually had enough resolution to see some things again. A lot of these circles, of course, are trees. And the graves, you, you can't really see them from this high up, but they were all white dots. And if you go look on, online, you could find some images where in um, the Vietnam War, uh, soldiers actually put like peace signs up here and stuff, but circles of rock so that you could see it from the helicopters. And there's a, a lot of pictures of it during the 70s. Um, you can't see the road, the Mangyang Pass Road, it would be down, down. Uh, below this slide or this image in Google Earth. 
Here's a picture shot from a helicopter of it. I don't know. This is probably in the 70s. Um, and, of course, you could see all the lime. And you could, you could definitely see the graves here. Again, this is 1,600 men that were buried up here uh, along these roads. This is the primary site. This is where the symbols were that the men had created. And down here, you could see that river that I was talking about that would come up. And, it, of course, it had unnamed you know, creeks and stuff that would come down into it. Here's another shot of it, of that from a different angle. Again, this is from uh, probably from the 70s, could have been from the 60s, could have been later. Like I said, the graves weren't removed. You could see them all again, all the dots, but there, there's no longer, uh, you can't see the white washed into the ground. There it is again from another angle. This is what the door gunner was. This is this is not my friend. This is just a picture I got on the internet. But this is what he did. And like I said, he was shot twice. First time he got shot in the leg, they put him in the hospital. When he got out of the hospital, he actually went back to his job, went back into the war again. And that time he was shot and the bullet actually went um, on the side of his head. Okay, I don't know if he was wearing a helmet or not. I never really talked to him in detail like that it was hard uh to discuss it and i tried not to bring up the war that much only when he brought it up and he really didn't bring it up in front of many people except for his buddies that were also in a war with him and very close friends um kind of like forrest said you don't just run up to somebody and start talking about the war you got to realize that these guys were extremely young you know the same thing with the the young men that were in iraq for example, um, you got to imagine how that messed with their minds. I feel sorry for our veterans, uh, especially those from political wars like Iraq and Vietnam. You know, I, I think World War One and World War Two were were much different than the latter wars, especially Vietnam. Um, they were not political. Those earlier wars were done for a reason; they had to be done. Okay, that is what helped build our country up and strengthen our country and eliminate what was going on in Europe. And you got to remember that a lot of the Europeans fled Europe because of what was going on and came here. All right. But anyway, just remember, these guys were really young and I can't imagine having to go through that stuff. Here's an example of a waterfall that you would see up in that area where Forrest would have threw rocks down. You know, from up in the sky to him, it just looked like a clearing. When he came down, there was nothing there but graves, and it was a terrible place. And he felt embarrassed to even go there. Here's one of those obelisks that Forrest is talking about that was laying face down. And you can see the bullet holes in there. This one side is written in French, and the other side is written in Vietnamese. But as I said before, sometimes they would have an epitaph up here. These plates were just like a default plate that I think they slapped on a majority of them. But if you were an officer, sometimes they had a little bit more, and this was like kind of roped in. It was kind of like segregated from the rest. And, of course, the average soldiers from the French War didn't even have this. They just had little aluminum markers. And, again, Forrest congratulated me on the research. This is when he's talking about tripping over one of these stones this is what you're looking at. This is it. And that is exactly where it was. You could do with it what you want, um, but but that's just a fact. Here's another shot at, like I said, this one is kind of fenced in. This is obviously, you know, people uh in in the Vietnam War and, and, and so on, they would come up there and leave things and burn candles and put all kinds of things up around here like a shrine. Here's that same plaque, you know. And this one, of course, is a lot bigger than the one that Forrest tripped over. Some, they were all different sizes. And some of these, of course, are still around. Some of them are actually along the road itself. Because you got to remember, some of the times, this is kind of gross, but, you know, there was nothing to bury. You would be destroyed at this location. So a buddy of yours would leave a, a marker there. Very sad. Very sad. So... Let me go back to my war for me and just read you a couple of excerpts from the uh, text itself. 
just to give you an idea of what Forrest was thinking when uh, how he discovered the place and, and what you know why he went there. And I'm not going to read everything. You can read it; it's online, and it's not really that much different from the one that's actually in the thrill of the chase. He's talking about um, his flights while he was up on his bombing missions, you know, up near the uh, the demilitarized zone up at the uh, north and south uh, Vietnamese border. And he's talking about, um, you know, how he would fly. And, and you got to listen carefully because this is how you discover the place th that he was at Mang Yang Pass. So Forrest Fenn says, suddenly something wonderfully innocent occurred. A small clearing appeared at 11 o'clock on my canopy and slowly worked its way under my left wing, only to disappear behind. It was odd because a small waterfall in the center of a clearing dropped water so far that it turned to mist before it could spread out on the rocks below. It must have been 200 feet or more. Large birds were circling around as if they also thought it was an amazing sight. How peaceful it all seemed. I remember smiling and telling myself in an idle whim, if I get back from this mission, I'm going down there. It was a silly thing and I knew it, but the seriousness of what lay ahead that day somehow turned the whim into a vow, a pledge of sorts. I felt I'd made a deal with, a beautiful, with that beautiful place. You bring me back from this mission and I'll come down there and personally thank you. The deal was struck. I trusted it, and it could trust me. It was our secret alone. So, you know, the, he he discovered that place while he was flying from his base down here. He would always fly up in this direction, and he always seen that as he was flying past, right? And he made the plan that one day he was going to go down there. So let's read about that day where he says it, um, this was uh, one day after he was shot down and one day before he returned home on Christmas. He says, It was time to pay my debt to the waterfall and that magic clearing to which I felt so obligated to. It was about an hour's flight to where the little stream dropped so mistfully into the rocks below. When we landed, the geography looked much different from what I expected and from what I had seen a mile up in the sky. The small clearing was now about 300 feet across and belly high grass, making it walking difficult. It was impersonal and disappointing. Now, keep in mind, I'm skipping some of this stuff. So he goes on to say, after sitting on the ledge of a waterfall and throwing rocks over the drop, the pilot said, let's go. As we rose and started walking towards the tall grass to get back in the helicopter, a strange chain of events began to unfold. I tripped over something and fell flat on my face. Then when I started to push myself up, I came nose to nose with a rude aluminum grave marker. How strange and out of place it seemed. I could barely read the dirty nameplate, but, it, but I did make out enough to see the name of a French soldier. Then suddenly we saw more grave markers. The more we looked, the more we found. These soldiers had evidently been killed during the French Indochina War. Before I could roll it, before I could roll it over, now he's talking about the uh, the uh, obelisk or cairn that he knocked over the grave marker. Before I could roll it over to see what it said, the pilot was strapping in. I had to hurry. A French name and rank followed by an arcing English words across the top. If you should ever think of me when I have passed this veil and wish to please my ghost, forgive a sinner and smile at a homely girl. Now, remember, um, I, and I know where that quote came from, and so do a lot of other people, but he's, I think he's just influence, influencing, or not influencing, he's bringing up the topic of death. You know, these people passed on, their ghost is there, please their ghost. So this is a you know a place where obviously the guys in the war died and he didn't know that he thought it was a beautiful place he landed down there and then he discovered that it was not it was a you know a pretty terrible place even though it looked so beautiful from up in the sky 
So he goes on to say, those words burned in my brain, and I could see them just as clearly now as I did then when I was so rushed. Is it fair that now no one recalls where those brave French soldiers fell, and now they are interred in that remote jungle clearing, hidden from life for a million sunsets? After a violent ending, they have been swallowed up in a serenity in a serenely beautiful place and at the same time hidden by the ravages of time and nature. Those who fell there in that hateful, wasteful, losing war, like the one in which I was currently involved in, are forever forgotten, save by me. It has been 58 years since that war, and no one cries anymore. For the next month, while I was on leave, the flourish of activities related to the homecoming and reuniting with my family and friends put the jungle thoughts on hold, except for the occasional flashes that insinuated something was still unfinished. I didn't know enough about what had happened to even speak of it, much less understand what I was feeling and what it could possibly mean. If anything, it took weeks to digest as the thought slowly started to seep back in. What was this all about? Was it nothing? It was all a foreign blur in my mind, like a dream that kept floating in and out. Before the war started, I didn't even know where Vietnam was, or even Southeast Asia, for that matter. It was so unlikely that I would be a fighter, fly to that place. Why did that strange clearing mean so much to me? Why did I survive 328 combat missions, but be shot down twice? Was it only to be drawn to that spot? What kind of fool would take a defenseless helicopter to that waterfall? It was more than strange that I would fall to the ground and read such a poignant inscription. And why did the words impact me so much? I had so much to think about. Now, that's pretty much where he stops talking about Vietnam, and then he goes on. We're still in my war for me, but then he goes on to start discussing um, later on another flight that he took. And this is where he starts giving the hints to Wyoming and to the location that I ended up at. Okay, He says, then one day in 1969, as I was looking through my flight logs, my eyes fixed on an entry that had a little explanation, but an asterisk. But I knew. I remembered every detail of that flight and why I marked it with an asterisk. That flight had been many years before 13, to be exact. The 13th of July, 1956. I was taking an old T-33 jet fighter from Stenville, Newfoundland to Pope Field, North Carolina. A party at the officers club had the Tained me longer than I wanted, and although I was not a drinker, my body was already weak and tired. Now, I'm going to skip some parts again, but he talks about the Philadelphia caper, and he's talking about a couple of things here, you know. 50,000 feet altitude where he was flying, if you don't have oxygen, your blood's going to boil. So he's talking about looking at the blinking oxygen center. Sensor. Now, I just want to remind you that that, I think, is a hint to Lovell, Wyoming. Because everybody had mentioned before, too, that this is a hint to Tom Hanks and the movie Apollo 13 with Jim Lovell in it. You know? Jim Lovell was the commander of Apollo 13. Jim Lovell was the only man to visit the moon twice. But, interesting enough, Jim Lovell, Lovell never landed on the moon. Apollo 13 was supposed to land on the moon, but they didn't. And the reason why they had to turn and come back was because of a fire and a failure in their oxygen sensor system. Interesting, right? So he's talking about a blinking oxygen light over Philadelphia. Now, the reference to Philadelphia is related to Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks was in a movie called Philadelphia. All right? That's why he had his thumb over Philadelphia. Also. Jim Lovell on Apollo 13 covered the earth with his thumb, and he said, look, I covered up billions of people. Uh, that was in, I think, Time magazine, all right? So all those are references to Apollo 13 
and Jim Lovell, because he's the one who did that, all right? And Jim Lovell also talks about the radio and the radio communications back when they discovered that they were going to have to go back home, you know? So Forrest is saying the same thing. He goes, no one was around. No one was on the radio. No one to talk to. The impersonal lights were there, but I was all alone. I covered Philly with my thumb, right? That innocuous incident made me wonder how important one average individual could be over the whole scope of life. We all live in a small cocoon of our own surroundings and with a few friends and places. We are all victims of our tiny environments. We stop when the light is red. We pay the gas bell when it's due. Strangers move in and out of our lives only to punctuate the moment with something useful, like a waiter or a paperboy. And now he, he just you know goes on and he's talking about his life now and what he accomplished. And he's relating it back again to Vietnam. He says, I am still alive. But what about those whose bones are rotting under the headstones of a thousand wars? Are we forever destined to the same old bloody waste forever, over and over? Surely there is more out there. But where? Looking back now, I feel like I was being slowly educated by a larger hand, one that I could not then identify. It is more than sad to me, not just that the French soldiers are dead and buried, but because no one knows where they are or even who they were. No one is crying now, and half a century has passed. The ground knows, the tall grass knows, but they won't tell. And what of the soldiers' wives and children? Have they gone on to live with a hundred forgotten memories? Sure they have. So in my mind, the lines have converged to tell a story That satisfies me that in my heart, where only there it really counts. Then he goes on. No one returns to tell us of the road we travel, which road we have to discover and travel to. Then he goes back and he talks again about his death and legacy. And I'll end it with this final sentence. I mean, this final paragraph. He says, So when this realization hit me full frontal, at least I knew. If I cannot enrich those whom I interact with each day and cause them to be better for my passing, their view, then I have wasted my turn. That I that I succeed in that endeavor is not as important as it is for me to make a solid try. For if the try is sincere, I have succeeded in whatever failure resulted. And now, at last, at least, for me, I know. And if no one should ever think of me when I have passed my veil, it will be of no matter, for I have finally found my way, and I am at peace with all of it. Now, before I go on, I'm going to show you how I related that back and forth. And I just, like I said, I discussed this in the past in other videos, but I'm trying to put it all in one spot. So basically, if you look here, we have the 109th longitude line coming down, and it cuts right through Tuiwa, right past Forest Friends Base, all right? That's 109 East. Now, if you remember back, I showed this picture once before. If we cut a chunk out of the Earth, the latitude lines are the ones that go around the Earth down to the equator, and then back down to the other pole. The longitude lines go around 360 degrees this way. Vietnam is at the 13th or the 12th and the 13th longitude latitude line. Up here at the 45th would be the border of Wyoming and Montana. So this is around 44 latitude right here, all right? Let's say this is the 109th longitude line. It goes up to the North Pole. That's 109 east, and then it comes down on the opposite side would be 109 west. So here we are over in the United States, and here's where 109 west is. It cuts right past um, just west of Cody, and it goes right through the town of Kerwin. If you, when you're reading my war for me, um, and think about that when you're over looking at my Vietnam pictures. 
But when you're reading the other stories in The Thrill of the Chase, think about this screen that I'm showing you now and think about how if we were to take that same trip from here without mirroring it, so we go, we would fly west, then the areas that I showed you would be right around in, in, in here, okay? And that's why a lot of his stories are centered around this area. Fishing Bridge, the picture is Skippy, the falls and stuff are over here. Basically, Mang Yang Pass would be somewhere around here if this is where his base was, right? You can actually figure it out. You could look at how many degrees it was when you're flying west, draw a line from Kerwin up to here, and you would see where it is in Yellowstone. This brown is the Yellowstone border. But remember, we're supposed to mirror it. So all of his story, Forrest in The Thrill of the Chase, he likes to tell stories, but the story is what matters. The, the area that he's describing is not actually where that story took place. Everything is mirrored, all right? If you took that same trip and mirrored it across the 109, instead of flying up in this direction, we would fly up in this direction. And basically, uh, Mang Yang Pass would be right over here where um, Medicine Mountain Passage is. And the French Graves would be right where the Medicine Wheel is. And the waterfall and everything will be right down in Five Springs. Okay, all of his hints to the town of Lovell, Lovell is right here. And it's the closest town to the Medicine Wheel. That's not the only hint he has. Straight up here in Montana is where um, Joseph Henry Sharp's cabin was. That's also where um, Custer was killed. Okay, so all of that stuff is, is all related, but the stories didn't take place where he said they take place. Because remember, he said that there were no hints placed in that book that are going to directly aid the searcher. Okay, he didn't make it easy for you. It's not like, you know, oh, go read the book and he's talking about Madison Junction, then something is at Madison Junction. No, that, that's, that's not how easy it is. But basically, when Jack says he wanted to know where Forrest wanted to die, Forrest wanted to die here. And up at this vantage point of the wheel, you can actually see all the way across the Bighorn Basin and see the Absaroka Mountains. You can see down by Kerwin. You can see the Tetons. Okay. And you could probably see the Wind River Range. All right. So you're looking whole across this basin. Now, remember the central highlands of Vietnam. Those would be kind of considered like the central lands of Wyoming, all right? Um, it's the same thing, except everything is mirrored. Now, here we are back at the Saab, and I'm, I'm not really going to get in here because you could go and look at my other videos with this stuff, but here's Medicine Wheel Passage. This is the same as um, Mang Yang Pass. So the, the graves would be over here. Okay, and this box that I drew is row, row four, block 23. And this is where the parking lot is for the wheel. So you would park your car here to walk up to the wheel. And in Texas, row four, block 23, of course, is where his parents were put in or interred. So row four, block 23. Here's the Medicine Wheel Passage, okay? Here's the Five Springs Road, which is uh, Campground Road. It goes up, it's this purple line here. And then this red line is the, the sun from the solstice shining down. And here's Rainbow Canyon, the end of the rainbow. It went right over the intersection of the road that we need to put in on. It goes right past the upper campground. And it goes right here where it meets the stream. Okay. Now I told you this before. Sam thinks that it was that the chest was up here. Okay. I think that it was right here. You have to ford the creek and it was down here. The falls are over here. It wasn't at the falls. It was halfway along the trail to the falls. 
and then you go across on the opposite side, and that's where the treasure chest was, in my opinion. And like I said, everything is related to Five Springs Canyon. And Five Springs is listed in a document as warm water, okay? They actually have the temperature of it there that they took down by the where it meets the Bighorn River, and they classify it as warm, right? And also five, there's five of them. It's plural, okay? It's right below the wheel, okay? So it's in a basin, and the tub in the basin is where water salt. Also, a spring is made from pressure in the water under in the underground aquifers as it pushes up to the Earth's surface, okay? So that's how the water halts in the basin, forms the creek. The creek goes and takes and goes into the canyon down, and then it goes over the waterfalls out here and into the Bighorn River. He's telling us to put in, and by the way, this is the home of Brown. The home of Brown is essentially the, the protected area. So he's telling you to put in at a lower altitude. The only other place we put in is here. And then he's saying from there, it's no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. There'll be no paddle up your creek, just heavy loads and water high. Here's just another screenshot to remind you of how these lines are calculated down there. The decam, Pomahat, that's the only area in the sky or the only star that represents the celestial sea. It sits re right below Aquarius and it's swallowing the water that Aquarius is spilling down. And this is the END. The END is ever drawing nigh. When you get, and he said, if you've been wise and found the blaze, just like the medicine man um, um, knowledge, we put our back to it and we look the way the sun is pointing. So he's directing our attention down here. And that's that line I just showed you. And there's, docu there's documentation, there's like five or six kiosks all the way from the parking lot, all the way up here, past that bench down here where Francis Brown is and Charles Brady and Hammond Wise. And then this is one of the diagrams that's on there that shows you what all of the cairns mean. And all of that stuff is described, what they mean, why they're there, how the Indians used it. Of course, they would have sun dances here. This is a national treasure. This is protected. This is an area of peace. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting because when Forrest Fenn got cancer, that was about the same time the 81 Indian tribes were battling the United States government over this ground. And I believe Forrest helped them. And they had claimed, if you watch my Francis Brown video, that they already lost Deffel's Tower, and this was their last stand. They were not going to lose the wheel. And no matter what tribes went up here to pray at this very sacred spot in Wyoming, even if they were fighting with each other in a war, this is an area of peace. There was no, no fighting allowed. And the road, the ancient trail leading up to that campground, and then eventually, if you keep going up to the wheel, is along that wheel is where they had the sweat lodges and where they prep on the way up. And then the tribal elders would stay up here and wait for them. After you were done on your vision quest, which lasted three or four days, just like his quest that he went on looking for Lewis and Clark, you eat a big meal and then you fast for three or four days. That's exactly what they did. Okay. And then after you're done at the wheel, you leave and then you go and you meet with the medicine man and he tells you what the results are of your vision quest. So here again, you can see here's that purple road. We put it down here, we go up the road, we park here, and this green thing is a trail. And then about halfway around that trail is where um, I believe the chest was. And that's where the sun intersects a bench that I'm going to show you. And that's where it goes into the wood. So you see it goes through some woods over here, and then it comes out into a clearing. And there's a bench here, because in the winter, you got a big view of everything down in the basin. And then, of course, it goes through the woods and it continues up to the waterfall. But I believe you had to ford the, the creek here. This is a sign that's right where you enter that trail. 
I'm not going to read it. You can feel free to read it yourself. But think about heavy loads and water high. And here's another sign that's that's there where that same kiosk is over here. That, th this is uh, another sign that's there. Five Springs Trail, in other words, water high. Not maintained beyond this point. Caution, fallen rocks. Those are the heavy loads. And they're quite obvious when you look along the trail. There's rocks all over the place. So this is the trail, and it leads back in there. Here's that bench. Of course, this is a winter picture. Here's that bench I was talking about in the clearing. It's still there. And then the trail goes off into the woods back here in this direction. <clears throat> As you can see, there's a canyon wall here. But then if you look over this side, down this hill, if you look quickly down there, there's rocks on the other side. And, of course, you would go down there, ford the creek, and go on the opposite side. But this is that bench I want you to see. Here's that bench again, but this time we're looking west. We're looking in the opposite direction. This is where you would come in from, and then you would go into the woods. But here's that same bench. So he's saying Marvel, you know, but Terry Scant with Marvel Gaze. Terry Scant is a short rest, which is the same reason why we're at the campground. Short rest, which is what the bench is for. But this is a sit and gaze. Gaze out, right? Terry Scant with Marvel Gaze is take the chest and go a piece. Here's that document I was talking about, and you can read it. And they got the water temperatures here. Here is the Bighorn River near the mouth of Five Springs Creek. So Five Springs Creek is is uh, classified as warm water. Okay? So there you go. You know, Toby used to like these kind of documents. Well, there you go. There's documentation that says it's classified as warm water. And it's plural because there's five springs there. Now, I want you to check this out. This is pretty interesting. I'm going to show this video, and that's pretty much going to be the end of what I have to say. I want you to see the end. This is your lush green forest. 